Welcome back to another episode of Option 5. My name is George Brooks. And on today's episode, we got the chance to talk to Dave Feldman. Dave is the VP of Design at Heap, which is an analytics company based in San Francisco. And we had an awesome time talking about his experience um, with product teams and specifically with designers and his background in design. Uh, there's just a lot of passion around collaboration being the top thing you know, when you're working on a really um, effective product team. So designers and engineers sitting right next to each other. Now, Dave has been around the industry for a long time. He's been working in product for almost 20 years. He's been at Google, Facebook, Yahoo, um, and many other places. He's co-founded his own company. And now at Heap, he's actually getting to craft a design team that sounds amazing um, around the way that they think about how we can really do the most effective work, build the products that are right, find the compromises that are right, and um, hopefully be able to think about the impact that each of our perspectives bring in the process. You're gonna love this conversation, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to throw it to you. Why don't you do a real quick introduction of yourself and then we'll, we'll jump into the conversation. Yeah, sure, happy to. So I'm Dave Feldman. I am the VP of Design at Heap. Uh, Heap is a product analytics company uh, based in San Francisco. Um, what's product analytics? Uh, you use our product to understand what your users are doing in your product. So get some insight into what your users are doing, uh, why they're doing it maybe, how to make them do some things more, some things less, how to basically like achieve your business goals through understanding your user behavior. Um, I've been in tech for about 20 years, um, mostly design roles, but I've worn a bunch of different hats. I started in computer science. Um, I've done some PM roles. I've been a co-founder. I've been an executive now. I've been a freelancer. Um, been at Google. I've been at Facebook. Uh, so kind of made the rounds. Um, and uh, the last thing I should definitely mention is Heap is hiring product designers. So if you want to join my team, uh, we've got lots of really interesting and complex design problems. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. No, it's fantastic. So you have made the circuit and designers go check out their website. I assume uh, job applications will be available on your website. Yeah. If you go to heap.io slash careers, and that's totally something I should have put in my plug. Uh, you can look for senior product designer. There's a job description there. Um, you can obviously hit me up on Twitter or email me Dave at heap.io if you have questions or want to start the interview process. Um, I think we've got a fantastic team and everybody says that, but it's still true. I've not heard anything but great things about your team. So I highly recommend people go check it out. Um, and especially, I love the fact that you guys are hiring even in the face of everything that's going on in the world right now. So congrats, that's great. Yeah, and I'd like to think that's a reflection of the fact that we actually value design as a differentiator, as something that's super important, as you know, a core part of our product development process. And a lot of my efforts over the last two and a half years have been really to build that up and to ensure that we are, we're, we're playing that out, that we're not just paying lip service to it. And we've built a process where design is fully integrated and highly collaborative. So I, that's a perfect segue. You kind of, you've been in a number of different teams and a number of different roles in different teams. What, if we kind of shape it more towards design, what are the, what are teams that look successful? What, what's their makeup? What's their profile look like? What's that, what's that DNA that makes uh, a really brilliant product team, the design led product team or design driven product team? What does that, what's that look like? Yeah, and you know, I might even I might even quibble a bit with the with terms like design led or love it, good um, or engineering led. Like when I talk about product development processes that work really well, I talk about collaboration a lot. I want the the design process and the overall product development process to be as collaborative as possible. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, one is that designers are not the ones who have all the good design ideas, and we have this whole stable of techniques around ideation that are designed to take a bunch of people, not all of whom have design backgrounds, and effectively harness their thinking, harness their different perspectives to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts and certainly greater than something the design team on its own could create. So a lot of how I think about putting together processes, how do we foster more collaboration? How do we foster earlier collaboration? How do we make that process as inclusive as possible in every sense of the word? So that's part of it. I also talk about pragmatism a lot. Design is a series of trade-offs and some of those trade-offs are trade-offs you make within your design. Are we gonna make this more discoverable or more efficient? Sometimes those trade off against each other, that sort of thing. Um, but there are also trade-offs we have to make to get a product into production. Like maybe the animations aren't as slick. Uh, 
Maybe. Don't say that. The designers will run. You know? <laughs> and some uh, developers, I mean, also, they love that as well. Yeah, exactly. And it gets worse. Maybe it's less usable. Maybe it's less complete. Maybe you right. got to hold the user's hand in your MVP. And yeah. maybe that's the wrong choice. But also maybe it's the right choice. And I think you make the choices best when designers are part of that trade-off, are part of that compromise rather than being one side of the compromise and someone else is making the compromise. And that in turn comes back to collaboration. Like designers often talk about wanting a seat at the table. And I think yeah. the strongest reason to have that seat, the best way to use that seat is to be part of the compromises that have to get made to get things into users' hands. Because of course, no matter how perfect your design is, if it never makes it into the product, who cares? Right, right. So, so that's interesting. Because what I remember you wrote an article that was kind of ranting on some of this stuff. And I think it was really, really good. It was a little bit controversial because you, you kind of poked at a lot of the things that you, especially the design community made the product community as a whole uh, riffs on a little bit. But I think you talked there, just there, about the fact that people say they wanted to see the table, but oftentimes it's them saying, no, I just want you to do it my way. <laughs> or <laughs> it needs to be pixel perfect, or it needs to be a very specific way. But what you're saying is that true collaboration requires that compromise. Is that, am I hearing that right? That's exactly what I'm saying. And I think you risk your seat at the table when you don't want to become part of that compromise. Because if you're just, if you turn yourself into a blocker, eventually mm. someone's just going to move the table on you right? Because we have to keep moving forward. We want to, you know, we want to build stuff. We want to meet user needs. We want to meet customer needs. And if the designers are getting in the way of that, then they're going to get booted out of the conversation. Right. And that's a loss for design. Yeah. And honestly for the product, because there's yeah. so much value of the design being at the table again, yeah. but it's really more about the fact that we're all bringing a different perspective. That's going to make the product better. Right? Exactly. And one of the really cool things about design and for that matter, engineering a lot of the time is there's more than one way to do it. Um, and so if my design is difficult to build or will just take a long time to build or doesn't meet some need that I hadn't anticipated, well, part of the fun is figuring out how to work around that, how to change the design and not lose what matters most about it while you know overcoming that obstacle. What are some... You, I want to be careful because I know in your kind of pragmatic design manifesto, which I want to jump into a little bit more here, but you talk about um, outcomes over process, which I think is, I've heard it said outcomes over output, but this is a little bit different. That's a little more nuanced. Talk about the outcomes over process because I tend to go, that's all sounds great, Dave, but how do we do that? <laughs> you know, to give me some processes, give me some constraints, give me some rules to follow that we can actually foster that type of work. But you're saying instead focus more on the outcome. So maybe you can unpack that just a little bit. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, obviously we need process. Sure. Uh, when you get a sufficient number of people together trying to pull in the same direction, yeah. and you don't put some process in place, what you get is chaos. And some chaos is creative chaos and some chaos is just a disaster. Yeah. Um, so that's where process should come from. And when I say outcomes over process, you know, all of the, all of the titles in that manifesto are X over Y, which I you know, borrowed from the Agile manifesto. Yep. And the choice of the word over is not arbitrary. It's not instead of, right? So outcome Good. over process means consider your outcome and tailor your process to it. Do it's no good. more process than you absolutely need to achieve that outcome. And one of the ways that it's useful to think about that, I think, is to think about design process as a toolbox rather than like a sequence, mm. right? So we often see the design process and it's like there's the thing with post-its and then there's the thing with sketching and then there's the thing with the like map and then there's the, et cetera. And right. those are all valuable tools, but you don't always need all of them. And sometimes you need other things. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So great, take that toolbox, look at the, the, the intended outcome, make sure you've identified correctly the intended outcome, mm -hmm. and then pick the things out of the toolbox that you might want and use them. Yeah, that's a great um, example. We, we do design sprints here at Crema, or you know, everybody calls them something different, but we, we'll just stick with the generic design sprints. And we talk about the same thing, is that there's a bunch of different activities that we can do within the design sprints. And it's, we have a guideline, kind of a rhythm of things that we know we're going to do. At the beginning, we're going to say, let's make a decision on what we're trying to do in this week or two weeks or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But then out past that, we may ditch a whole day's worth of what we thought we were going to do in the original agenda uh, mm -hmm. in favor of something that was, that'll better serve the outcome. Um, and that's, that's really difficult though. You have to have a team that's 
has a mindset to be able to willing and allow themselves to make that kind of change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's easier just to say, here's the process and we'll follow it and we'll get what we want. It's yeah. harder to say, okay, we actually have to re-examine the process every time. Right. Um, but in a sense, it's what designers ought to be good at anyway, because we're always examining the requirements and saying, what is the right solution to meet these requirements? Um, right. So it's effectively applying, applying how we design to how we design, if that makes sense. No, it, it totally does. What, so what are some kind of um, principles that you have, whether it's from the manifesto or otherwise, what are some principles that you have that kind of guide how your teams work as a collaborative team or as designers themselves? What, what are some principles that guide you? Well, I'll go back to collaboration and dig in a little bit more. And okay. you know, I think if, if I'm tying it back to the manifesto, the closest principle in there is communication over creation. Sure. Um, as designers, unless we're also the engineer, and even sometimes when we are, the goal of what we produce, the goal of our process is communication. Communicating to ourselves well enough to understand if the design is going in the right direction. Communicating to our users in a user test. And most importantly, communicating to our engineers and PMs so that they can both implement, but even before implement, understand well enough to implement, you know, with, with all of the context they need to do it well and to, you know, uh, fill in the blanks and tell us when we've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does that mean? Like on a practical level, I'm a huge fan of low fidelity. So I'll start there. Um, I'm a huge fan of low fidelity for a couple of reasons. It's, there's a part of me that always cringes when I go to sketches because they're going to look like crap. Um, sure. Then I get into it and it's so fun. It's so freeing because I'm like, oh, I'll draw this thing. And then it, it's, it's bad and I'll draw a big X through it and I'll just throw it out and I'll do another one. Um, and you've wasted I, two and a half minutes versus a couple hours. Exactly. So that's great. I don't get attached to the things. That, and to your point, more importantly, I can just chuck it, chuck it until I get something I like yeah. and then maybe start upping the fidelity. But sketching is also a more inclusive process. Everybody can sketch. I'm not a yeah. good, like, I'm not an artist in the sense of I pick up a Sharpie and something beautiful comes out. It looks like crap. And, and that's kind of the point. Um, yeah. But an engineer can do that. A PM can do that. Someone on the solutions team can do that. And so, you know, that's kind of the bedrock for ideation in many ways is that you can get a bunch of people together around a whiteboard when, you know, we can ever go back in the office again or like a Miro board today. Yep. Yep. Everybody can sketch stuff and we can talk about it and we're on an equal footing. Um, third reason I like low fidelity is because it allows you to focus on the focus the conversation on things that are not pixels. So mm. at some point, you absolutely got to focus on the pixels if you want it to look nice. But in the early stages, that's not what's, what matters. What matters is not whether we've chosen the exact right button, but whether there should be a button there at all. And right. if you draw the button at full fidelity, the temptation is almost unavoidable to talk about it at that fidelity. So you you the you match the conversational fidelity to the uh, artifact fidelity. That's really good. Now I'm curious though, just to push on that a little bit, because I maybe incorrectly, I, you know, you take an opinion, take a stance on something. At one point I, I really challenged my team to say, stop wireframing. Now mm -hmm. I, we mean wireframing as make basically making high fidelity gray boxes, <laughs> um, on a screen, mostly because we were trying to do user testing this was a few years back. I mean, this has been a while, right? We were trying to user test with um, gray boxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the tests were like, well, I guess it will be fine. I don't really know what it'll look like. I assume it'll be great, uh, you know, all these other things. And it was really difficult to test. W when you use the sketching, it sounds to me you're talking about more so when it's in the brainstorming or the collaboration or the ex explorations stage. Do, how, do you, how do you go about actually validating or testing at what point do you see that that process take place? Sure. Honestly, it's curious more than anything. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I think wireframes are fascinating because I mean, candidly, they make less sense than they used to. Yeah, we totally design agree. Systems, we have flatter designs than we used to. So like there's less mucking around in Photoshop. Yeah, um, that's right. So Apple may be bringing that back. Um, <laughs> that's true. That's true. And what that means is Assembling a wireframe is no faster in many cases than assembling a mock-up. That's it. So, That's exactly, that was always my point. It's like, I could design this just as fast as I can lay out gray boxes now. Yeah. So I do think wireframes have their place, but I think that place is much narrower than it used to be because okay. we can go straight from sketches to mock-ups in many cases. Now that doesn't answer your question. How do we test stuff? 
Yeah. Usually we're testing something that looks more like a mock-up. One thing we've been doing a lot at Heap that I like is what I'll call mixed fidelity. So okay. we have like a few, actually even in our like design library, we have a few wireframe components for like our left nav and stuff. And what I like about that is that it, it helps to indicate that this thing is not finished, but then you can take the bits you actually need to test and render them at higher fidelity. So there's not the additional cognitive load on your test subject. Yeah, interesting. Now, I don't think it's crazy to test sketches. I don't think it's crazy to test paper prototypes. You got to watch your handwriting if you're me. Um, <laughs> me too, me and you too. Gotta, it goes back to the notion of outcome over process. What are you trying to get out of this test? And honestly, what is the lowest fidelity artifact that will get you that result reliably? Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, okay, so when you go back to design being at the table, I want to I wanna understand, so you talk about the collaboration. How, where do you see that breakdown? Where do, you see, where do you see that go wrong? Because I feel like there's so much that we talk about. Here's the ideal. But sometimes I want to I wanna kind of frame that against... Yeah, and here's the places where people stumble or where they struggle, and then how can we kind of close that gap? I mean, at the risk of going a little broad, I think a lot of it comes down to, to understanding and listening. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that, that famous, I think it's Stephen Covey quote, understand, then seek to be understood. Yeah, that's so good. And it's, it's an important principle because we all forget to do it because that's how we're wired as humans. And yeah. so you, you need to like install that as a background track in your head. And I think a designer's job is often to be understood very well, going back to this notion of design is communication. So mm -hmm. the designer has to listen to the feedback they're getting. I think one, one super important, if sometimes unfortunate design skill is someone comes to you and says, make the logo pop, everybody loves that one. Or <laughs> yeah. um, can you turn this from a checkbox into a switch? And if you just say, well, I'm not going to use a switch here because this has a save button and switches are typically for things that commit immediately. Right, right. You're responding to the, you haven't necessarily done the like investigative understanding work. Why do you think it should be a mm. switch? Oh, that's the thing. Okay. I understand now. I basically reversed engin engineered your design principle or your use case or whatever you're thinking about by asking a little bit more. And now I understand that it shouldn't be a checkbox or a switch. It should probably be something uh -huh. else. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened if I didn't take the moment to understand. So really understand what you're hearing from your cross-functional peers and in turn, learn how to explain your rationale and take the time to explain your rationale for your designs so they know, because like I said, design is trade-offs. They know, yeah, I consider the thing you're talking about and here's why I didn't do it. Here's why it seems like a good idea. Like fantastic idea that you thought of this alternate design Here's why it doesn't work. I, I, I've been in so many of the situations where I wish, I wish that I would have just said why. Like that, I think that is such a powerful word. It's such a powerful question to just be like, or what do you mean? Go, yeah. Tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, rather than saying, oh yeah, I'll just do that for you because that's, you know, that's the easiest thing is just to check the box and say, yeah, I did it. Do you like it now? Or to go, no, you don't understand because I'm smarter than you in some yeah. way. Yeah. And like I said, it's, we all get it wrong because it's yeah. natural to get it wrong, especially when emotions are running high, especially when you start to feel defensive or you're tired. And I guess I think of it a little bit like checking for your keys on the way out the door. You try and build a muscle memory around it. Yeah. So like when you forget to ask that question, something in your brain goes, crap, I forgot to check for my keys. Let me go back and check for my keys. Let me go back and ask the clarifying question. So good. Okay. What are the principles? What other principles help teams work great or help designers to flourish? What drives you? Another principle I've got in that manifesto is stewardship over choice. And I think this reflects, um, I started geeking out on behavioral science uh, a few years ago, and I know that that can be controversial because- Oh, no, I love it. I, I want to see where you go. So this is good. But I think one thing that is hard for designers and technologists in general to accept is that we are manipulating our users, just to put it as bluntly as I can. Yes. And that's for not for evil, who knows, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's loaded language and yeah. I used it intentionally to be a little bit controversial, but what we're actually doing is guiding them. And guiding is just a friendly way of saying manipulating. Right. Um, so we can guide or manipulate them knowingly or unknowingly um 
But when we simply say we're going to give everybody all the choices, we're going to make sure they're making informed choices. In some ways, we are. We're saying, I'm not. I'm not responsible, and mm -hmm. I'm going to let the user figure this out, which is a lost opportunity to help them. Um, now, it's also, you know, it's easier in a sense because you don't have to take responsibility for getting it, it wrong in that regard for guiding them down the wrong path. Right. But our whole profession is about understanding user needs, user desires, what their goal is. And if we can understand that well enough and then guide them toward it, then we've reduced the cognitive load, we've made it feel easy, and they're grateful in the end. And of course, you can do things like provide the choice with the right type of information architecture yeah. so that you, don't, you, know, you have to be looking for it in order to, to find it. Um, but I think not that nobody does this in design, but I think sometimes we forget that it, it actually is our job to channel our users down the right path, where the right path is defined at whatever the what, whatever achieves their goal, whatever afterwards they're like, oh, I'm really glad that they made it that easy to do that thing. And it is a bit of a paradox, right? Because it is through both listening to them and understanding, or even using analytics to to actually better understand how they're using the product that we have in front of us. Mm -hmm. how we can use that information to then shape even more of the, let's say manipulation of how they're using it. And then that loop continues. Yeah. Um, I, I know this is, this is tangential, it's, but it's kind of anecdotal. The, um, have you heard of um, Darren Brown? Mm -mm. He's, a, he's an illusionist in, in um, the UK and he's really famously known for just doing these effectively brainwashing tactics. Hmm. And, um, I mean, he would, you could call them, um, uh, yeah, uh, hypnotism or something like that, but what he, he goes back and he's very transparent to say, there's nothing magical about this. I'm just very good at influencing people. And you have certain people want to be influenced so that you have certain users that are like, Oh, I just, I will, I will endure wherever you want to take me to get to this incredible user experience or this in incredible outcome. Hmm. Um, and then you have the people that are the, I hate everything that anybody else has ever designed. And so it's never good enough. And I am going to complain because complaining is what I do. Mm -hmm. But Darren talks about the fact that he can, he can manipulate. So it, there was a point in time when actually I was reading, writing a, a series of blog posts about what you were talking about, which is to say, as designers, we have the responsibility to carefully manipulate people. Um, so I love the fact that you went into this space because it is, it is, like I said, it could be used for good or for bad or to actually bring them value or to bring me revenue or the both, you know? Um, and so how, how do you, how do you shape that? How, how has that landed as you've talked to your, your design teams about that? Do they, do they get empowered by that idea or does that go like, that's just more responsibility than I want in life? <laughs> um, huh. I don't think I've worked on a team since I started getting into this that was like, no, this is bad, but that's, it could be coincidental. Like I started sure. when I, when I, when I worked on, uh, on inbox at Google, yeah. um, oh, we rest just, in peace, man. I miss inbox so yeah. much. Um, this was, <laughs> was my favorite tool. Um, and I think, I don't think anybody felt disempowered. I think we did have some debates where I was on the side of, yeah, let's nudge people in a particular direction and yeah. others, you know, within and outside the design team or more on the side of, no, 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 let's give people the choice. And it's hard because when you do a user test, if you ask the user in the test, they will generally tell you they want the choice. And yeah, so you're of going out on a limb and saying, we're not going to give them the choice, or at least we're going to bury the choice a little bit because we, we believe they will be happier in the long run. So those debates did happen. I'm not going to claim I won them all. Um, Fair enough. But I don't think anybody was just like, you know, categorically opposed to the whole idea. Well, and it goes back to a lot of, I mean, we build enterprise software mostly, right? And so a lot of, a lot of the solutions that we're building has a, we'll call it a dashboard at the front of it. And so many dashboards, the, the, the product owner will come back and go, yeah, make sure that everything's, it's a customizable dashboard that they can drag and drop all the panels to exactly where they want it. And I'm like, or we could just set it up in the most optimized way. And yeah. they're like, well, then but what if it's not a, we could test that, <laughs> you know, like it's really, that's a, that's a hard thing to do to not, cause again, it comes back to responsibility. Now you're expecting the person, well, it's not, I'm not liable. You could have set it up however you want. Um, yeah. And, that's, and I think it often plays out in a debate between designers and engineers. Sure. Um, but having, you know, worn both of those hats, 
uh, why don't I say it? It's, it's a debate between the design brain and the engineering brain. Sure. Because as an engineer, you want to think through what are all of the things that could happen? To you? What are all of the things that might go wrong? But also, therefore, what are all of the things that a user might want to do? And then to say, okay, let's make sure they can do them all and let's make this thing comprehensive. And the design brain, at least if they're bought into what I'm talking about here, you, you say, well, what's the critical path here? How do I make that as clear as possible? How do I make that opinionated? And those two things are at odds. And that debate is actually useful because yeah. sometimes you do want to check box and settings. Sometimes you like legitimately have two user personas and you need to flip the behavior. That's right. Sort of, like, right. there's not, there's not one. I was reading a, I was reading an article about the invention of the mouse. And one of the things I hadn't realized is that there were kind of two factions. There was oh, like the one button, one button people and the like three button people. Uh, and yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't arbitrary. Uh, like one of these factions, and I think there, there were two individuals, one of them, I think the one button was Larry Tesla, but don't quote me on that. Um, it might even have been Engelbart on the other side, but like, I could be wrong about that. Um, sure. The one button argument is, let's make this something everybody can just pick up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today's terminology, let's make it discoverable. Uh -huh. The three button argument was, let's make this something that allows people to be hyper efficient. Mm -hmm. even if that means they need some training. So optimization is kind of the end goal, given the ability or the functionality to do that. Yeah. And so that means it's guiding you less in the interest of giving you more options. And again, that's not always bad. Right. Uh, same difference between, say, Photoshop and Apple Photos. Mm -hmm. Like Apple Photos, I would push hard for a really prominent button, and I think they've done this. It's like, make the picture better. <laughs> Right. Auto. Photoshop yeah. or Lightroom's a better comparison. Actually, does have the make make the picture better button, but it's it's a lot smaller. And then there's all these sliders. Uh huh. And it's you know again those users they're pro users they need and want the choice. There's a lot of fiddling around, and that's fine. Um, so you know that doesn't mean you don't apply those same principles in something like Lightroom, but where you draw the line and where you allow choice and where you don't or where you don't promote choice changes. How did, how are your teams structured or how have you seen teams structured that foster this type of work? Cause some of the principles that you're talking about are really are mindsets, they're postures, they're ways of thinking. For sure. Um, and they are fostered by access and like you said, collaboration and space. What, what does it look like at heap? What's it look like at other teams that you've worked on? Um, who was on that team and, and what, what fostered that type of work? I think, man, I, I don't think I have a great answer for you. I think okay, that's all right. Um, it could be it could be what went wrong too. You know, that's that's all I right. Think at Heap, one of the things we did was we instituted something called a product quality review. Okay. Um, that we've increasingly moved up to the very front before like mockups have been made. We bring bullet points and sketches to this thing. Yeah. And it's a it's a review with the executive team. And the purpose of the review primarily is to litigate the trade-offs amongst product quality, um, timeline, and scope. Are we making the right fundamental trade-offs with this project? Um, and the reason I bring it up is that then begs the question, what is product quality? Mm. Uh, and as luck would have it, I have a blog post on it, but the blog post was like, okay, let's take this thing I wrote internally and you know, publish it. Sure. Uh, and I, I actually, I broke it down into five parts. Uh, completeness, opinionated, or I guess complete, opinionated, usable, polished, and something that starts with E. Uh, crap. Um, efficient. Okay, yeah. And the O for opinionated cuts right to the heart of what we're talking about here. Um, I was going to say, opinion is the one that stands out as being unique. I haven't heard that before. So how do you, how do you what do you mean by that? So opinion is another word for what we've been talking about, which is, this thing actually has an opinion about the use case and the way in which someone would want to do it, the best way to do it. Mm. Again, that doesn't mean there aren't other ways to do it, but it means that way is promoted, that you're nudging people in that direction. Yeah. Uh, and by instantiating that as part of, like, part of our process, part of the conversation, we can at least talk about, is this opinionated enough? Now, we can still disagree on that, and in fact, that's a useful debate, but the sure. notion that a high-quality product is opinionated at some level becomes part of the expectation. Um, the reason I hesitated in saying I have a great answer is I think we're, I don't know how well that's working yet. I think it's working a little, um, sure. I think we are, 
the degree to which opinionated is something we we like care about as an explicit part of our process now versus a year ago yeah i think there's going to change and that's just progress the reality is is you make you you take steps towards it right so there isn't ever a perfect there's no perfect team people will talk about man i just wish i could be a part of crema i'm like oh if you think that crema is perfect then probably you shouldn't join here because you'll probably ruin it or something. It's that idea of like, don't, don't go to someplace that's perfect because you'll ruin it because it's realities we're humans, right? We're, we're flawed and we're figuring it out as we go. And we're, we're going to bring perspectives that are helpful and sometimes distracting. Um, I'm, I, 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 I like this, this word opinionated because it, it, it is the reality that we're all making opinions um, or having opinions, making assumptions about what we think should be true. I had this idea, this this framework that I use. It's kind of like the the four part reality, right? So there's ought, is, can, will, and so the way that things ought to be is like if we could design the perfect interface, it would just have no problems. Everybody, be, it'd see it the same way. It would adapt exactly to them, their worldview, their culture, everything, right? Um, and and everybody would be happy. Well, that's not the reality because we the is so is like we live in this world where there's constraints, there's conflicts, there's diversity of thought, there's you know all these things, which is good, but it creates a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and then the can is okay. What's that reality? What can we get it to? I mean, we might not be able to get it to the the odds, but can we get it to some place that's kind of got that balance? And the will is the reality of this is what it ends up being. You know what we made this. Yeah, uh, we tried to close the gap as much as possible, and and we move our decisions forward and go on to the next thing. Yeah, because <laughs> that's just how life goes. Yeah. Um, um. Okay. So, what's what is one area that you think someone can start to take action? If you were to say, here's a piece of advice, I would say, as a designer or as someone on a product team, here are some areas that you can just take small steps forward to start closing some of these gaps, start improving the way that you the view, the way, the, the way you view your products and the way you view your teams that you're building products on. Yeah. I think if you're a design team, include your engineers, mm. not just once, not after you've gone off and designed the thing for two weeks, but constantly check in with them, like challenge yourself to talk to them too much. Yeah. Um, and then you can always that. scale it back. Um, when they start telling you to go away, you succeeded. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, there are certainly like getting interrupted is, is annoying if you're in the middle of something. Sure. So, well, A, be respectful as a designer. Yeah, that's but good also point. B, challenge that. Like, you know, you're say the hope is that you're saving them time and energy later on mm. so that you, if there's a reason why what you're thinking about isn't feasible, you're talking about it when you're, it's a sketch on a whiteboard and not when it's a bunch of mock-ups and certainly not when they've already implemented half of it and something comes up, mm -hmm. right? You're moving those decisions further up and you're giving them the context to understand what they're building better. Um, you know, obviously you can take it too far, sure. but um, I don't know that I've ever seen it really taken too far. <laughs> So maybe not far enough. How, how are your teams set up? Are they set up cross discipline or you, do you have like a design department or how would use the word department de design teams that then, and then, um, engineering teams, are they, are they set up where they're working, um, as a team that focuses on one outcome or product feature area and they're collaborating, or is it more so the design team will pick up whatever needs to be worked on and hands it over to an engineering team that picks up whatever needs to be worked on? There's, those are kind of two uh, camps that we see the most. Yeah, it's kind of in the middle. And some of that is just a necessity given our size. Um, we currently have two product designers. So okay. um, that's, that's just not enough yet to, yeah, makes sense. to devote to work streams. But my, my ultimate goal would be because of the relationships it, it fosters to have a designer who exclusively or almost exclusively works with a particular engineering squad on a particular PM. Yeah. 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 Um, good. And then to make sure like you could, there are certainly organizations in which the designer actually reports to that PM. Mm -hmm. I think having a actual design organization, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, makes sense for us. But at the same time, that also is a forcing function for the designers to come together and critique together. Um, yep. Like in many ways, the design team, Team becomes a secondary team, but it's a, it's an important secondary team, and so the reporting structure is a forcing function, and the actual project work is the forcing function to keep them working together with their uh, engineers and PMs. 
So the way we refer to that, and I think teams have lots of different names for this, but we talk, call them product teams. So the product teams are the cross-discipline teams, right? So that's exactly what you described your aim, your goal is to get to. That's how we shape all of our crema teams. But then what we have also is what we call craft teams. So our craft teams are um, all designers across multiple product teams will get together. They'll critique each other's work. They'll share best yep. practices. They'll you know learn together and they meet on a pretty regular rhythm or they'll have just a shared Slack channel or Loom videos or stuff that they're just sharing resources all the time. Yep. Same thing with dev. The dev team has that. The product management team has that. The test engineer team has that. Yeah. And so each of them have a craft team, but they're not working day to day with each other. Really, they're right. working day to day with the other engineers or whoever else is on their, their squad or their pod. Yeah. And you, I think you need both of those conversations. Yeah. How are, how are you learning? I'm always curious. The people that are talking about, you know, that they're putting thoughts out into the world and they're, they are um, trying to say, here's a perspective I have on the way things maybe should be or the way things are. Um, where are you soaking up information? Is there something you're reading or listening to or studying? I mean, all of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like to learn. I, I'm not happy when I'm not learning. Um, who's a highlight? Who's, who's somebody or is there an author or maybe a subject right now that you're just kind of nerding out on? Yeah. So I'm reading a book called um, Leadership on the Line. And this was recommended to me by my executive coach. And by the way, I love having an executive coach. Speaking of learning, like I think as a leader, as a manager, you want to make sure you've got a feedback loop where certainly when you don't know what you're doing, you can go to someone and say, Hey, I feel like I don't want to know what I'm doing. And honestly, yes. half the time they're like, yeah, you do. You do. You just, yeah. you, just you just needed a little push. It's all good. Um, but also to have someone when you say, Hey, this thing happened and it worked. And they're like, yeah, kind of, but you got lucky. You done <laughs> like yeah, all of that. Yeah. Um, and they recommend books. So this book is called leadership on the line. And I primarily it's about this notion of adaptive leadership. Um, yeah. And that's a concept that's contrasted in the book with technical leadership. And I'll explain what those are. Um, like, it's one of those ideas where once you understand it, you're like, yeah, okay. Now that you said it, I kind of knew that that was a thing that I didn't have a good way to talk about it or to think about it before. I yeah, love good. ideas like that. You're like, uh -huh. okay, you made it was right in front of me and I never saw it. Yeah. So technical leadership is the straightforward stuff, like the logistics that need to happen, hiring people, handing out tasks, providing design feedback, whatever. Adaptive leadership is the stuff, and I, I'm sure I'm doing a bad job of this. I'm no, you're good. Well. This is great. But I love it. Adaptive leadership is the stuff where you have to change people's attitudes and assumptions, yeah. and cultural norms, yeah. and expectations. And I think one reason it's hard is we tend to mistake adaptive problems for technical ones, and then wonder why it's not working. Um, so, thinking about talking about this in this conversation, I came up with an example, which is this: like, say your design team is organized by platform. So you've got your like designer who works on the web product, the designer who works on iOS, mm -hmm. designer who works on, and you're realizing you want to move to cross-platform ownership of feature areas. Uh, so you get like a more holistic user journey. Yeah, it's a reasonable thing yeah, to do. Great. Um, so you start to talk to your designers, and one of the, the iOS designers is like, you know, I'm really worried that the iOS experience won't have end-to-end -end consistency if we do right. that. Now, the natural response and a good response in part is to say, okay, here are all the things we're going to put, put in place to ensure consistency. But you also want to ask yourself, why is this person raising this question? It could be that you just challenged their identity. They're the iOS mm -hmm. designer. They own the whole iOS product, product and you're taking that away from them. And so that emotional transition needs your attention. And if you don't realize that that's there and don't address it, they're never going to be comfortable. They're just going to keep raising more technical challenges. So how, how do you, how do you work against that? I mean, does it go into, I'm curious, or how, if you, as you're kind of processing through it, where, where do you find that you can allow people to kind of shift their mindset or how do you help them to shift their mindset? It, it may still be that they have to go that route, even if their identity is in question, but how do you help them to adapt in that moment? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I'm still figuring that out, but yeah, we maybe. all are. Yeah, I mean, we all are. I, I, I don't think this is one of those things that you nail and then it's great. I think one of the yeah. things I'm looking at in the book is that this is always hard. Uh -huh. And sometimes you find yourself in the middle of an adaptive challenge where you just have to back off because it's not going to work. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. If, if all of your designers are going to quit based on this reorg and you can't figure out a way to fix that, you might have to hold off on the reorg. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think the, the answer, as we discussed before, starts with understanding, starts with stopping and saying, 
you know, this designer says, I don't think the iOS experience one event and consistency. What do you think? What worries you there? Like, why do you think that that consistency isn't going to happen? Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. How might you address it? I think if I were tackling and it kind of went down the path where I was getting that sense of ownership, mm -hmm. I mean, you could call it out, I guess, um, and say, hey, do you just, do you feel like you're not sure that you're going to have, like, I don't know, you, you could go that, down that route. The other route you could get go down is making them responsible for and giving them accountability for solving the problem. Like, you're right. not the iOS uh, designer anymore, but it would be great if you could tackle how we make sure there's that consistency. It would be great if you set yourself up as the iOS subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. but even, the, even though the projects you're working on are cross-platform, people have iOS questions, they come to you. And then if you did something like that, you'd be taking that identity and also that expertise. Like it's not just an emotional thing uh, and making it available, making that an official thing. Um, I don't know. It, no, it's, oh, I think we talked about this when you and I were prepping for the podcast, that this so aligns with um, the work that we're doing around our postures, disciplines, and structures, which a lot of our previous episodes have been about. And so it's around that idea of someone has a posture or a mindset walking into a situation because of everything they brought to it, um, whether it's the amount of work that they put in, or maybe it's something going on in their personal life or whatever, you walk in with a feeling, you walk in with an emotion um, to the moment. Mm -hmm. um, how we adapt and change is really how we react to those feelings, whether they're good, positive or negative feelings. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's how we're working within those emotions, those mindsets, that, that posture. Um, and that's, that is a, it's a difficult thing to do. I think reality is humans are terrible at this. We can look at the world right now yeah. and it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, but then you can shape those things by the, the disciplines and habits we have. So it's like, as we start to create new disciplines and activities that actually allow us to have the ability to, to, like you said earlier, I don't remember what the topic was, but you were talking about the fact that it's a muscle, right? We have to work that muscle, be comfortable asking the question on a more regular basis, using the language. So for example, we use, and it was super uncomfortable the first very first few times that we did it. Um, I ask at all my one-on-ones and almost all of our leadership meetings or even some of our retrospectives, I start off the meeting with, what are you feeling? Yeah. And it literally is a question of, we show a giant feelings wheel, which is the most anxiety producing thing ever. Um, but you have to name two feelings. So in this moment right now, I feel anxious and excited. We might be excited about the potential of what we're working on right now and anxious of whether or not you're right or if it's going to work. Um, but knowing that someone's feeling that way and their mindset is there, like you said, I feel like I'm supposed to own iOS and you're taking that away from me. Yeah. Um, knowing that and just being vulnerable to share that and communicate that, uh, we have found has been an incredibly powerful tool um, to adapt. Yeah, I might steal the, uh, the feelings wheel from you. That's cool. It's, um, it's been super helpful. But I think you've hit the nail on the head, just asking, how are you feeling? Making space for those feelings and occasionally holding people's feet to the fire. I have certainly asked, how are you feeling? And I get a technical answer. How are you oh. feeling? Well, uh, I'm trying to work through this problem on this yeah. design project. And Not what are you I'm doing? Not, yeah. And yeah, I might actually, I, like, let's have that conversation. And then I'll say, okay, but I asked you how you were feeling. Tell me uh -huh. how you're feeling. Which is yeah. why I like the feelings wheel, because it suggests a set of answers. It gives them, I think people were terrible at naming our feelings. Um, or having even a broad vocabulary of knowing what, what could be a feeling. To be fair, I put this out on a recent post and I had one guy rant on me for a while about the fact that 90% of the words on this wheel are not actually feelings. And I, my point was that doesn't, don't, let's not get semantic about it. The point is to, to drive it a conversation so we better know how to value the perspective of those around us yeah. so that going into this, we go, okay, well, where is the compromise going full loop back to our collaboration? where can we make compromise? Me understanding your perspective, respecting it, but also knowing we can't just get stuck going, well, you think that and I think this and we're never going to move forward. But right. finding compromise, um, uh, Clear Left uh, Agency in London wrote a great blog post called Consent Over Consensus. And so their idea is the fact that at a certain point, you just have to consent that we're, we made a decision, we're moving on. Uh, yeah. Consensus is not always the best place to be, that we're not all going to 100% always agree. Yeah, um, that's really hard. There's the common phrase disagree of, and uh, disagree and commit. Yes, um, which I think captures the same thing. But I think the key and what you're getting at with the asking how people are feeling is 
disagree and commit only works if you under if you understand the disagreement before the commitment happens. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's if right. all you do is say, what do you think? And they say, I don't like it. And you say, okay, we're going to do it anyway. It's not really disagreeing and commit. David, I, I, you, you've got so much, so much goodness. We're, we're running up on time here. So I'm, I kind of want to leave it at what, what are ways, um, we going back to those action items or kind of those ways to learn, where can people learn more about you? Um, obviously organization you're hiring right now. So definitely check out positions and maybe you can just work right next to this guy. Um, just soak yeah. up his knowledge, but also, um, where can people more learn more about you and what you're putting out in the world and what you're thinking about? Sure. Um, I'm D Feldman on Twitter. I'm D Feldman on medium. Um, I'm, I'm at dfeldman.co, which is mostly just a link to that other stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, heap is at heap.io. That probably covers it. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, like, like I said, this has been such a, um, insightful conversation. I love doing this. I love getting to nerd out with other leaders who, who are just trying to think about one, how can we do the best work possible? How do we make sure it's human and also get really good value and good outcomes out of it? Yeah. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're trying to do at Heap. It's what you're trying to do with designers, with your team. So congrats. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've really enjoyed this too. Same reasons. I think as leaders, it's easy for us to get isolated. Yeah. And yeah. get isolated. Like leadership is hard and it's emotional. And you start to wonder if you're doing anything right or if you're just a complete failure. And so like talking to other people is nice. It totally is. We, we have some consultants that um, we work with in Liverpool who I just got off this morning chatting with. And like you said, having an executive coach, they're basically our executive coach for me and my business partner. And every time I talk with them, it's like, Oh, thank God. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> you know, like I can, yeah. it's just enough to keep going and them going, you guys are, you're doing okay. And they challenge us. They, they push us to do some more, but it's like, you're okay. Um, let's just keep, keep moving forward. Put one foot on the other, the other. Um, she, my wife very much appreciates. Cause then at the end of the day, when we go for our little walk, we walk our dog around the neighborhood. Yep. He's like, you talked to form. You, the, the, the group is called form. He was like, you talked to form today, didn't you? And you're like, yeah, how do you can <laughs> You just, you, you, you got a little more pep in your step right now. So I was like, yeah, yeah, it's good. So this, these conversations give me that, that energy. So thank you for, for coming on. Thank you for having the conversation. Thank you for doing what you're doing with your teams. And um, I hope that more people will pay attention to what you're working on. And if you can hire some more designers, go, go apply for a job there and, and join his team. Cause it, what Heap is doing in general looks awesome. And I'm really impressed. Yeah, it's, I, I, I honestly think Heap is a fantastic place for a designer to work and, and yeah, come join us and thank you for the time. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. It's good to, good to talk to you. Well, I really enjoyed that conversation with Dave. Um, I hope you picked up his passion for collaboration, really that, that removing that space or that isolation that happens between designers and engineers. Um, but there's always going to be this compromise, right? There's always going to need to be the, the, the space to allow yourself to hear the perspective of both, find the right decision for that right moment and move your product forward. Um, I thought it was really interesting how we got a chance to go into the topic of um, whether or not we should try to quote unquote manipulate people. Um, or maybe that we should be guiding them towards a more optimized experience rather than putting the responsibility back on the end user. So there's, I think just some, as a designer, even as a developer, there's some things that we could really carefully think about that goes back to our postures, our disciplines and our structures, and really how we think about creating those inside of our products. If you're not already, make sure you go check out Dave Feldman on Medium. He has an incredible um, breadth of knowledge that he puts out on his posts. And they're nice, short, digestible um, um, Medium posts. And two that I really want to highlight, um, one that took off a few years ago, that but I think is still relevant now, is the five rants of a cranky designer. Uh, it's just a really good um, take on some kind of cultural things that we should be thinking about, some, some process mindsets, communication, um, um, ways of thinking and, and maybe some things that might push some buttons for people. So for example, uh, don't mistake the mock-up for the product. Um, we as designers, myself as a designer, I know that I have done that in the past. Um, and in the response from that, uh, that blog post, he actually wrote another one called the pragmatic, um, excuse me, the pragmatic design manifesto. And it's a great kind of principles driven document, which I think 
that a lot of design teams should actually take and really think how they could apply this. So communication over creation, realism over idealism, stewardship over choice, purpose over art, outcomes over process. So just some simple ways for us to think about what are the principles that are driving your creative team? And then remembering that everybody is creative, that the designers and the engineers are both trying to create something that's valuable and useful for the, the end user. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. As always, I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe and um, leave us a little review. If you can, got to go to iTunes for that one, I think. Um, go over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review and a little comment goes a long way to tell your friends and family, um, your bosses, your coworkers about what you like about option five, how it's helping maybe you and your team work better, how it's in inspiring you to be better at your craft or maybe look at ways that you can collaborate more. Um, and if you would, um, check out crema.us slash podcast for all previous episodes. There's been a bunch of other conversations, a bunch of other interviews, as well as um, actually Dan and I getting to process through our, our new framework um, that is really talking about how teams can be more adaptive, how we can uh, maybe do work in a way that helps people to flourish and thrive. Um, and if you want to, go check out crema.us to learn more about the uh, organization that brings this podcast to life. Crema is a digital product agency where you get to use creativity, technology, and culture to help individuals and organizations thrive. I love working there. I've been a had a chance to work there, well, since it was started, because I'm one of the founders, but also since we've grown up to um, 40 plus people on our team now that are just getting to work with some of the most incredible organizations around the world. And I'm blessed to be able to do the work that I do with them. So check us out, crema.us. Um, and then I, I just hope you have an awesome day and check us out for the next episode. We'll have another interview or another conversation with Dan and I, where we get to explore really building great products and great product teams. Thanks everybody. Bye.